Hello and welcome back to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration with Crastorio 2. As you've probably noticed, videos have been a little sparse on the channel over the last couple of weeks. That's because I was away on holiday, but I'm back now, so normal service will be resumed and the videos will carry on as they used to. And so, let's get stuck in with the summary of this week's stream. The big thing we got up to this week, which I think is going to be the headline of this video, uh, was we went on a big road trip. So um, Mike got the Caladrian, that's this this combat ship here, ready for, to go off on, on, on a journey. And so it's been filled up with various things like rocket parts, um, rocket fuel, and, and various other things. We all bundled on board and then set off for, for distant parts. So the idea was that we were going to fly out around the universe and explore some of the other solar systems. Because out there, there are quite a lot of the planets that have the pyramids on them. So we wanted to go out, investigate those pyramids, discover what we could find in those and uh, both information and and parts and again sort of you know ca carry on towards getting this game actually completed. So first we headed over to Argus and it turns out there's quite a lot of planets here and a couple of them had uh, pyramids on them. So we dropped down on uh, the planet of Snek where there is a where, the, where there's a pyramid. We went in there very very quickly dealt with it. Now we've deleted the surface again to save on save file size but if I redraw it we can see that down here there is in fact a pyramid. So we went in there had a quick explore, explore of the uh, of the pyramid and we found this uh, a sort of an E character with Shrek ears on it we've decided to describe it has. And so we took a screenshot of that and then carried on. The next place we went to was down here, Bishamonton, that also had a pyramid. Razor did not, so it's not all exoplanets, it's just it's just some of them, there's a handful of them. But while we were here, Tristan decided it would be a good idea to also launch a large number of probe rockets. And so he dropped down a, a probe rocket silo and then started putting in probe rockets into there and, and, put in, and launching them out with satellites. And so if you launch those inside a solar system, you will very quickly find all of the planets and moons inside that system. So you can see we've now got all of these moons, all these planets around here. So we found out quite a lot of extra information from this. And we don't really need any of this information. I don't think we're ever going to go out to any of these planets. I mean, okay, there's a load of uranium here, which could be mildly useful. There's a load of iridium here and coal and oil and so on. So, I mean, there are useful resources on all of these planets, but it's quite a long way away and we have enough of each of those resources anyway. So we don't really feel the need to go off to any other planets. But since we're going to need to launch satellites anyway in order to get the telemetry data that we need to make the gold rocket science in order to carry on doing just all of the science stuff, uh, we thought we might as well just launch them from here and find out a little bit more about the universe we live in as well while we're at it. After exploring Argus we then flew on over to Penthus because it's fairly nearby and we basically did the same sort of thing again over here. Over here we discovered that Wyvern, Sinon and Znok all had pyramids on them so we went down and explored those and once again Tristan did a load more uh, satellite launches and discovered all of these extra planets. And whilst we don't have any proof of this yet we have a strong suspicion that the planets we have already discovered are all of the ones with pyramids on them so we think, we th we think there probably aren't any more undiscovered planets with pyramids. So launching these uh, these satellites out, is, yes it finds us new planets, but none of these have pyramids on them. I can go and look at this one and see that it's a lovely fetching purpley red colour and there's a load of resources on it. But if we look on the map you can see that there's no pyramid on here and the pyramids always appear quite close to the centre of the planets. So there's no point in giving this planet any further investigation unless we actually wanted to come down here for the resources, uh, which to be honest we don't really care about. So this planet is again, once again, going to be more considered more or less useless. And in fact having been out to Znok, Sinon and Wyvern, we can, this, this entire solar system is now useless because we've we've taken the screenshots of the pyramids and we've flown off with the, with the resources we found in them and so there's nothing here left for us at this point. After Penthus we went over to Alacrity and over on Alacrity we found another three planets that were worth exploring, Ion, Amadeo and Jet Nova. Those again had had the pyramids so we explored those and plundered them and found a load more other planetoids as well. So from all of this, we managed to get, we did gain some modules. Each pyramid has a tier nine module in it and those are quite valuable. So we're bringing those back with us over to the, uh, back, to the back to the main factory. And as you can see, I managed to grab an efficiency module out of that lot, which is not particularly useful, but we did find at least one productivity module and at least three speed modules. So the productivity and speed modules will very quickly find their way into these uh, labs over here or into the, into the uh, beacon next to the labs in order to boost the amount of, um, th of, of, of science we are able to do. In fact, looking at that one, we should probably upgrade that to a compact beacon, because I think we'd be able to get both of these with a compact beacon, and then the tier 9 modules we shove in them would have a little bit more effect. The next thing I want to talk to relates to the uh, the archaeological victory puzzle. So uh, this is going to be full of spoilers for up for the sort of very very late game space exploration and that big end game puzzle. So if you don't want to be spoiled, then uh, skip forward to about 12 minutes and 26 seconds. Well, uh, or to the next chapter where I'll uh, carry on talking about other things that are a bit less, a little bit less spoilery. But for now, let's have a, let's have a look at what we've discovered. So we have now been out to 13 different uh, pyramids, and we've taken screenshots of every single one. And well, here. 
here, here they are, along with labels to show you which planet they came from. And you can see that each one of these has a has what, what the uh, game calls a cartouche, which is the two circles in the middle with all of the symbols on them. And these are where the puzzle comes from. And, uh, the, and we, we're starting to get a bit of an idea of what's going on here. And so you'll notice I've, I've grouped them together a little bit here. And there is a reason, there is a logic behind my uh, behind, behind this. And that is this is because some of the symbols match. We've noticed that each cartouche has a unique center symbol. So, for example, up here in, in, uh, in on Talos, we have this sort of thing with the squares on neck we had the E with the Shrek ears, on Amadeo we had this thing that looks a little bit like a scorpion, and um, that one of the hardest parts about actually telling them apart is coming up with a good description for them that allows you to work out what you're actually what you're talking about when, you, when you're referring to them. But the important thing is that whilst the, each, each centre one is unique, round the outside there are various ones that match up, and so I've, uh, I've grouped them up together like this to put all the ones where a centre one and an edge one match up. And so I can, if I show that with these red lines here, you can see that, for example, over here with Snek and Talos, the E is in, in the centre of Snek, and it's then on the edge of Talos up there. Similarly, uh, with Amadeo, which has the scorpion, that's on the edge of Snek and on the edge of Talos. So these three are in a group together. Across the bottom with Bishamonten, Jet Nova, Terrace, and Ion, these are these are also grouped together in that they are all linked, but they're only, but they're linked sort of in a line. There's no cross links between them. So, for example, Taras and Bishamonten are not linked together. Jet Nova and Ion aren't linked together, and so on and so on. So this makes me think they're in a line, whereas the other ones are in little clusters. Tango and Agnea are just a pair. Sinon is all on its own over there on the edge, which is very very sad. The other thing I've noticed is that. When you have a, a, a match like this, when you, when you have a centre symbol linked to an edge symbol, the symbols around that edge symbol tend to link to the symbols around the other one's edge symbol on the other one. So to try and make this a little bit more obvious, let's have a closer look at the, uh, at the, at the triangle in the top left. So on Talos, you can see that Snex E is up here in the top right, but then around it we've got this sort of three and a funny Y thing and a running man with two heads and I don't know, various things around there and the various ones around the top as well. And those all connect, as, as I've shown with the blue line, to the ones around the edge on Snek, and also you might notice that the, what the blue lines are all around the uh, the squares thing on Snek, that is the symbol for Talos. So it feels like for each each one that links across, then all the one, then a few around it also link to the ones around the reciprocal one on the other cartouche, if that makes sense. So there's a certain there's a certain linking back and forth going on there, and you can see with the, the similar things going on with Amadeo with the orange lines and the green lines. So there's quite a lot of back and forth going across here, where they're all sort of it makes it feel like they're all sort of in the same area. And I've come up with a bit of a theory about this, which I don't I don't have any strong evidence for, but I have um, but I but I have my suspicions. And what I think is going on here is that all of these different cartouches are essentially arranged on a large sphere, a sort of like like the um, like the vertices on a football, should we say. And then each one of those is linked off to 11 other cartouches around it. The, sort of the, the 11 that form a sort of a circle around it, I guess. Um, and so uh, it's going to have to be quite a big circle for this to work. I think it's going to have to be a kind of multi-dimensional uh, sphere for this to work. But anyway, the idea, the idea being that they're all sort of they're they're, they're all together in a sh in in a shape. So they're all they're all in, in a little bit of a cluster. And so I think once we found all of them, we'll be able to build a sort of a a sort of sphere out of all of them, and then go, okay, lovely. Now what do we do with this? I don't really know quite where we're going to go with this, but I have a feeling that they are at least sort of starting to come together. And so we can see that we, we've kind of found a few sort of little chunks of this sphere. So we've got the Talos Snek Amadeo one, we've got the Znok Oliran Wyvern one, we've got the Bishamont and Jet Nova Taras Ion strip that's going around it somewhere. And also, if we look at some of the uh, other ones, if we just look at the edge bits for, for a second, we can see that this sort of goblet-shaped one on Agnea matches the sort of goblet-shaped one on Amadeo. So I think there is another planet's cartouche that we haven't found yet that goes between those two. So those two are relatively close together. Similarly, Sinon's sort of weird N-shaped thing is linked to the same one shape on Jet Nova. So I think those two are probably vaguely linked as well. I'm sure there are a lot more links between them than, than, than I've drawn on here. I just wanted to sketch in a few of them to give a, to give a vague idea. Um, just to show that I think as we find more of these pyramids, as we explore more of these pyramids and get more screenshots, we'll be able to start linking up the diagrams more and more and more. Um, I don't know how far this is going to actually get us with the solution to the puzzle, but it's taking us in the, in the right general direction at least. 
There are also the triangular cartouches on the, or the triangular part on the bottom part of the cartouche, where you, um, and I haven't really put any thought into these yet because I haven't had the time or the brain space due to jet lag. However, I suspect we may find some useful information in that as well. So that is going to be another thing to look into. Maybe I'll report back on that next week. We'll see what we find. Through research, we found a load of these star mapping datas where we see groups of stars that are forming, well, these are these shapes are very, very similar. In fact, they match the shapes on the cartouches. There's the uh, there's the goblet, for example. And so I was hoping that we'd be able to do some matching between these and the uh, and the planets. And then and I was, I was hoping that this would com confirm my suspicions that to say Talos, Sneck and Amadeo were all in the similar sort of area on this on this sort of sphere. Um, because I was hoping all the, the numbers would match up quite closely. However, very interestingly, we've noticed there aren't any matches between central symbols on the cartouches and the star mapping shapes. Absolutely no no matches between them at all. And we've got 13 of the pyramids explored and 15 star mapping patterns. So I did the I, I briefly did the maths because we believe there's going to be about 60 of them, but I think that might be spoilers. I don't know if we're supposed to know that yet. And I, I worked out that the chances of us not finding any overlap um, through collecting all of these just by chance was about, well, it was certainly single digit percentages and probably very close to about 1%. So I think the game is being a little bit mean with us and is um, giving us star mappings and pyramids that don't match up deliberately. However, this just means we need to carry on doing both of those. We need to do more star mapping researches, we need to go off to more pyramids, and eventually we'll get enough that they, sort of think they can't help but overlap. Either Tristan or Mike, I forget which of them it was, noted that all of these are unit vectors, so they have a total uh, distance of 1. So if we take this as an x, y, z position on a polar coordinates, that would mean we, or they all they the 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 vector points at a point uh, exactly one unit away from the uh, from from the origin, which makes them a distance rather than a position. Or alternatively, it makes them a position on a sphere surrounding the origin. And I feel that kind of supports my theory that the um, that they're all going to match up with positions. And so when we do find the ones for Talos, Sneck, and Amadeo, it's going to turn out they are actually quite close together. But as I say, further research is required. Further further launching of um, doing of star mapping data and further visiting a pyramid is going to be required to get absolutely um, to be absolutely sure of this. How this is going to relate to programming the, um, the Stargate over in Fenestra, well, that's a mystery for later on. When Once we've got a bit more information and we've started to manage to put together a few more hypotheses, then we'll try and come up with something, some sensible way to get this the system set up. Okay, I think that is enough waffling on about um, what, what we've uh, what we've been guessing at and making up and, 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 and puzzling over and confusing ourselves with. So, you know what, let's move on a little bit. This chapter is going to be loosely related to the puzzle, however it's not really going to be involving any spoilers apart from a few, a few of our sort of guesses here and there, so you're probably safe to watch this one even if you're trying to uh, solve the puzzle yourself, but um, I'll leave that one up to you. If you want to skip forward to the next chapter, that's absolutely fine, it'll start at about 23 minutes and 2 seconds, so you can just jump forward to there and, and carry on as uh, when, you, when you're ready. So the next thing that happened was that Mark decided it'd be a good idea to start carrying on with Trying to trying to find out what some of the new toys we've got do. So he he built a dimensional anchor over there over here, and I talked about these last time because uh, we we built we actually managed to build one in the la in the previous stream, but we realised that they take an absolutely phenomenal amount of power. As you can see here, it take it requires 60 gigawatts, and so a little bit of expansion of the power production was required in order to do, to obtain that. So Mark has done that. He's come out here. He's bumped us up from about the 50 gigawatts or whatever we were at before up to now 103 gigawatts, which is crazy. That's that's almost nine thousand solar panels creating that 103 gigawatts which is ridiculous but that does mean we've now got enough to put pump 60 gigawatts into the dimensional anchor and still have 37 to give into the energy beam injectors and another six for the emitter so we can keep all of these systems running keep our spaceships flying properly keep all of our um, outposts powered so yeah we've now got an absolutely mammoth uh, solar array over here and it's keeping everything running nicely, so that, that's good. However, putting this dimensional anchor down doesn't seem to really have done very much. It's sitting there, it's trying to charge up, and it's complaining about not having any electricity, despite the fact it's pulling in uh, the 60 gigawatts that it claims to need, and it has an energy capacity of a terajoule. I, I don't know. Do we need to throw even more power at it? I don't think we do, because if we look at the power graph again, you can see we have some excess spare power available at the top. It is taking what it wants and what it expects to take from the, from the design. So we're not quite sure exactly what's going on. Going on here. However, we do have a suspicion. This is called a dim dimensional anchor, and if we look at the Stargate out in Fenestra, we see that there's a thing over here with some lights with an anchor symbol by it. So we have this strong suspicion that we're going to need to go out and put in one, eight different dimensional anchors off in different star systems around the around the universe, and give each one of them 60 gigawatts, which is going to be 
fun. Uh, and then and then presumably when we power up the Stargate over here, which itself takes another 10 gigawatts, then we'll be able, then these lights will come on over here for each one of the anchors and they'll presumably appear to start working because they'll link up to the uh, Stargate over here. We're not sure about this. This is once again a guess, but it seems reasonable. There's a bit of sort of common sense behind it. The thermometer icon here is presumably linked to the uh, thermofluid that we need to pump in over here. So that's going to be another thing we need to do. And then the target is presumably for setting when you set locations on all of the things around the edge of the Stargate to tell it where you want it to go to. And we reckon that, yeah, as, as I think I said in a, pre in a previous video, we've seen some we've seen some coordinates here and there. We think maybe we need to do that. We need to find a way of programming those or possibly the inverse of those onto these and that requires us to work out the coordinates of all the various symbols and so on and we think that's probably where it's going but we'll 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 find out as we as we get a little bit further into it so running the dimensional anchor off solar panels is it, it, it is it's possible you, you you can do it as you as you've seen over here because we've done we've done it with it takes it took almost 9,000 solar panels although granted 45% of them are in use for other things but so, I mean, we're still going to need about four and a half thousand solar panels on it uh, in other star systems in order to power their their dimensional anchors which is ridiculous but doable over in Fenestra there is basically no solar power uh, if we look up here we can see solar is what well, it says zero percent apparently it is actually zero so generating the 10 gigawatts required over here is going to be a little bit more um, tricky there are various possibilities we could fire a beam receiver out here but that only has a 0.3 uh, percent throughput so we'd need a phenomenal quantity of solar panels in order to get a beam uh, generator firing enough power out here we could put in nuclear power, but that requires or antimatter power, but those require water to generate steam, and they're just a bit of a faff. So we've decided that out here we're going to use the singularity reactors, and these come from K2. So using them for a space exploration puzzle is perhaps slightly cheaty, but these numbers are so big that I, I kind of don't care. And also I know that quite a lot of balancing has been done between K2 and SE to make things a little bit more reasonable. And so making a singularity, you, if you make a singularity reactor, you can then chuck in the uh, the appropriate fuel cells, which are these things, the charged singularity fuel cell, which are made by taking an empty fuel cell and then filling it up with a thousand matter. So my plan is that we will bring matter out to here, probably in a spaceship with some giant tanks, pump it out, pump it into these fuel cells, and then just have a row of the singularity reactors across here that are going to provide the power for the Stargate and for anything else we need around here, like um, thermofluid cooling. And so, to that end, Mark has started building stuff. Over in Norbit, we have the machine here that is making these singularity reactors. Hurrah! And it's got all the stuff comes in and we can make a singularity reactor. Uh, and quite a lot of it's being brought in by Belt, so um, I think we've done a reasonable job here. We're only bringing in the Anaquian processors and the antimatter reactors by uh, by bot, and those are both very expensive and uh, a low throughput thing, so I don't feel too bad about this. I think this is, this is, this is re a reasonable use of bots, even I think that. Everything else can be brought in by, by, by belt, which is quite nice. What are we what are we doing up here? Oh yes, then we need to make these things, the basic matter stabilizers. And these require, well, some of the stuff is fairly normal, like lattice pressure vessels, magnetic canisters, are we bringing those in? Oh, we bring them in by bot, okay. So they're being brought up in quite large quantity by train from the ground um, because we need them for one of the sciences somewhere. But we have a little bit of over overspill bring, being brought over here. And then also some, um, some, some catalogs, because we're gonna need those. Again, high value items or very particularly awkward items. So bringing them over by bot, not too bad. And that allows us to make these matter stabilizers we can then turn the basic matter stabilizer into a matter into an actual matter stabilizer with again some more really really expensive stuff so so we're bringing in the quantum processes and the ai caused by belt so that's not too bad it's only the tesseracts we're bringing in by uh, by bot so that's pretty good we can make those and then they can be fed up here into this this machine which will then try and make them into the uh, singularity fuel cells which is going pretty well most of the stuff we need for that is being brought in by the belts here as you can see so we've got energy control units and is that cryo oh no it's, it's the immersion plates being brought in in there. The only slightly awkward part of this is nitric acid and that feels like a very weird thing to be putting into an advanced product like this because normally I feel like you've got these sort of things that are normal intermediates for making stuff in space and then you've got a few weird and exotic things like the tesseracts and some of the catalogs and so on. Requiring nitric acid in order to make the uh, these high-end singularity fuel cells feels kind of weird, but why not? Uh, let's let's let it happen if, if it needs to. But to make that, oh, I see. We're just going to bring it in by barrel. Okay, fair enough. So we're going to bring bring in uh, the we're going to bring in nitric acid barrels, presumably from down on the ground. Where does this belt go to? All the way down here. Down, down, down to this belt down here. Okay, so so Mark is planning to bring uh, nitric acid barrels up in the train from on the ground. I'm, I think that's probably sensible. There's a lot of fluids and gases and things required to make nitric acid, and pulling nitrogen out of the vacuum of space to, in order to make nitric acid from it would feel very, very wrong. 
So yes, those are going to come up here. And then we don't actually have, do we not actually have a disposal belt up here? Maybe we don't because none of this has actually produced any junk. Well, what's this one? <laughs> yes, we do have a disposal belt down here. So Mark, you can put the em empty barrels onto here and then they'll be taken away to be recycled. It's, it's, it's quite, it's going to require quite a lot of extra building because it's going to be all of this distance. Sure. But, um, uh, at least the, 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 the belt is already in there to an extent. So yeah, this, this, this will make things, uh, I, I hesitate to say easier for you, but it'll, but it'll make things at least manageable. Anyway, so once you've made all of those, they're apparently being passed down a belt down here. This is going to be, this is going to be a very, very expensive belt to fill. Where did these go to? That appears to be putting them onto the scrap belt. That can't be right. Oh, no, I see. That belt is... But yes, so what was happening before is there was another underground here like that. So this is this is a scrap belt. This is being taken away for disposal because Mark didn't realise that this belt that this belt could be uh, could be put in. Fair enough. That makes a lot more sense. So they're just being... So the, the uh, completed fuel cells are actually just being put out into this chest, ready to be taken away and used wherever we need them. And so these are a these are a renewable resource. They're a bit like a barrel. You fill the bar you fill the barrel up with matter. You put it into the into the uh, reactor. It comes back out again with all of its matter gone. Fill it back up again. And you put it in. So we should only need a relatively small number of these, maybe two or three per reactor. So we're looking at probably less than fifty of them in total. So making enough of these isn't going to be too difficult. And we then just have to take them all off to Fenestra and then keep a decent supply of matter coming in. And in order to ensure that that works nicely, well, Tristan has been putting in a few extra matter tanks over here just to fill up with the crazy, crazy quantities of it. Because, well, we do have, we have an awful lot of it, but we're probably going to need a ridiculous amount of it as well. So we've got rather a lot of tanks, and I'm going to assume that they've all been linked up fairly sensibly. It's kind of hard to tell. He's also trying to put down a matter assembler down here. I'm not 100% sure what for. Uh, maybe this is for making matter cubes for us to, if we ever want to ship them out by um, uh, in, in matter in the solid form. But as we've discovered before, if you start shipping matter around in solid form, yes, it packs down a lot more neatly, but you do lose 50% of it. So I'm a little bit wary of, of, of doing that. But we'll see. We do have plenty of um, raw, res raw ore coming through here to be turned into matter, so we should f we'll probably fill all these tanks up before we've decided exactly what we want to do with it. And so, with all those machines being produced, we are about ready to head out and try experimenting again with the Stargate. So, because matter is a is a um, isn't an unlimited resource, I think we're not going to want to go out and just sort of run the things constantly. But we can go out there, plug everything in, build up the uh, generators and so on, turn it on for a little while, see if see if the um, the anchor that we put in Kalidus orbit starts to behave itself and do useful and interesting things and then also see if the Stargate responds to it and potentially even see if the Stargate responds to it being turned on and off. So I think there's some um, there's some potential in here to find out interesting things about how the system works but also there's still a lot of investigation needed and if it does turn out that we get one anchor light from that then that means we're going to have to go out to lots of other star systems and put in four and a half thousand solar panels in each one. Now, I suppose we could upgrade to the Naquium solar panels, these ones, because they produce twice as much power, but they require a Naquium cube and a load of superconductive cable as well, so that's kind of pricey. I don't know. We'll, we'll see what we feel. We'll see how much Naquium we have available and how, 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 we, how we feel about that. And speaking of Naquium, the supply is currently, well, it's currently insufficient, so we probably shouldn't start making Naquium solar panels. <laughs> but as you can see over here, we, we have a decent supply of the crystals, and as always, we're a bit short on the ingots, because, well, we're just ripping through them to make the science packs. That said, if we look over in, in the science area, we do have a nice healthy supply of all of the deep space sciences. Um, they're being made nice and quickly. Up here, we've got some machines running. Okay, so we are making uh, Naquium tesseracts and Naquium processors, so we are getting through a certain amount of Naquium over here with making these sort of things and the processors, the processors, then they're not backed up but there there isn't a huge shortage of them, we we have quite a lot over there and the Tesseracts are doing pretty well as well. Over in the science area we have, well we have lots of lots of cubes over here and they're, they don't, they're not being taken away yet so that's that's doing well and we have, we actually have four and a half thousand uh, Naquium ingots over here in this, in this warehouse so we're not doing too badly at the moment, we have, we seem to be I'm not going to say we're on top of it and it's doing really, really well, but we seem to be sort of kind of hanging on. And if we look at how Naquium supplies have been going over the last hour, well, we've made 137 per minute of them. We've only used 119 per minute of them. So that means there's an extra 20 per minute for the last hour that have gone into storage somewhere. So as of right now, 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 
we seem to be kind of okay on the Naquim, and that's quite impressive. On this, on the 10 hour view, we uh, we, ha we had some problems. We're only, we've only been making it at 106 per minute and using it at 127, so that's clearly not sustainable. But that's probably due to this sort of flat line over here and uh, and these sort of blips, I, I, I don't know. And we've had some bigger spikes along here. I think it might be because the science has sort of slowed down a bit at the moment because we have a shortage of energy science available, energy science 4 available due to our ongoing holmium shortages, which I shall talk about in tomorrow's video. So potentially, if we started doing a different research that used lots and lots of deep space science but didn't use energy 4, then we start to have problems fairly soon. But Energy 4 is used by most of the researchers around here. We could go in and do carry on with a mining productivity or something like that, which uses uh, Bio 4 instead, and that only uses Deep Space 1 as well, so that'd be even easier. Or we could do the Portable Singularity Reactor, which uses Deep Space 3, and none of the colours of space science. Or we could do more long-range star mapping, which absolutely hammers the Astro, because we're using all four tiers at once. And that's, yeah, that just, ham abs as I say, absolutely hammers the production cap capacity. And then uses Astro, uh, no, and then uses Deep Space 1 and 2 as well, just to sort of, you know, top, top it up a little bit. We could chuck a few of these in, just to, just to see how it goes. Or we could wait for Tristan to finish the Holmium production, which he's he's working on. It is, it is He's making definitely making progress there. But as I said... I'll talk about that tomorrow. I did do a little bit of fiddling with the Naquium production because it turned out it was, well, it, it had stalled. And after a bit of scratching my head because all of the inputs over here had uh, had plenty on the, on, the, on their belts, I eventually realised it was because the beryllium hydroxide here had failed or had wasn't being produced fast enough rather. It hadn't actually failed. It was being produced, just not very quickly. And it turned out that was because over here, I just had productivity modules in these two um, in these two chemical plants over here. And that meant they weren't running fast enough to produce the beryllium hydroxide hydroxide quickly enough to produce what we needed. So I played around with a few ideas. I was considering moving these two machines over to here uh, in order to get them underneath this beacon, which would have helped a lot. That would have been that would have been that would have been the ideal situation, the ideal fix for it, I think. But the problem was I'd then have had to do something funny with the um, with the acid feed around here. Now I am kind of tempted to still do that because these machines are not running as productively as they might do. If I got them in under here, we'd see that this you see this machine is running at a, a speed of 38.8. This machine is only running at 11.2, despite having speed modules in it. So if I move these two over here so they're under the beacon and then upgraded them to tier six modules, they'd use a lot less of the um, the barrel ore, but they'd still produce, actually they'd still produce significantly more beryllium hydroxide. So I think that's going to be very worth doing. I shall try and find a way to squeeze them in over here and then reroute these um, pipes so they can probably probably stick with the undergrounds going across here as they are and then have these ones a square lower and then have it poke in up here. So I think that's going to be very worth doing. It'll it'll give us a little bit of an efficiency boost on the on the um, beryllium uh, that we're coming that's coming through here. And that will mean there'll be a bit more beryllium that comes out down here to be taken away by the spaceship because at the moment the beryllium is only just, again is only sort of hanging on by its fingernails. If we look at this over the last hour, you can see we produced 522 per minute. We've used 417. Actually, so this, this has dropped off quite a bit. But you can see there's been a bit of a drop off here. Over here, we're using it at 550, which is about what we're producing it at. So when it's being used heavily, we have prob we we can only just keep up. Fortunately, it dips off every so often, and so we we are able to keep up. And this is actually slightly healthier than I than I thought it was. But we are still. I would like it to be producing a little bit more if we can manage that. Uh, and I don't. And one way to do it would be to come out here and bring and put in more core mines, so we've got more more of these core chunks coming in, and redesign this so it runs faster, and then redesign it. And uh, it's, it's, it'd be a huge, massive redesign, which I'm trying, kind of trying to avoid. Yeah, there is there is potential for upgrades here, but also it, it would require a fair amount of rebuilding, which I'm not eager to do. I also noticed that the, uh, the tra this train down here was was sitting here like a lemon when we'd run out of the um, the vitalic reagent down here, the, the green bottles, uh, and so this was this was a little bit of a problem. I think the train was previously programmed to head go up every five minutes or something like that if it, if it hadn't filled up, uh, just to see if there's anything available to bring down, and that's not ideal. So uh, I've added in an extra couple of um, bits and pieces around here. So we're bringing in, we're bringing in a signal here, for Talos for Naquium. This is how much um, of all of the resources we have, and I'm then adding on the the amount that we're requesting over over here and that means that if any of these are greater than zero that means there's some of that available up in space so we're then telling the train that if you've been idle for five seconds and there's something available in space or you're full or various other things that it triggers off then head up there and go and get some more so it does mean that the train will sometimes go when it hasn't really got all that much stuff in it to take up but it does mean that every, all the resources that are brought into orbit were brought down a bit more quickly and and um and, and effectively so I'm not quite sure why it's not going at the moment because there's clearly stuff available up here. Maybe there is enough 
of all of these things flowing into it that it has it isn't managing five seconds yeah it's not managing five seconds of inactivity even though it's being told to go if it goes idle so this means if we run out of anything then the train will go very very quickly once the uh, production system s stalls over here and if it's running a bit slowly the train will go as well but that's also fine um, but as it is it's just going to wait until it fills up and which it, well it has done now and then it can head off and go and get some more stuff I also built a couple of new spaceships to do the uh, Stardust run, so we're going to have an additional two that are flying out there, collecting the Crush Naquium and bringing it back. So hopefully that means, yes, that means there is one, oh no it doesn't, I was going to say hopefully that means there is one in the queue up here waiting to, uh, waiting to land in Stardust. There is not. The next one that's going to arrive there is the Stardust Express down here, but if we look here, is there one at the moment? There is not one at the moment, so hopefully the Stardust Express will arrive before these, these warehouses fill up completely. I don't think it will. I think that means I, need, I still need more, 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 more spaceships doing the route because as, I, as I've said in, in the previous videos, I want to have a spaceship queued up here all the time just so that I know that there is always stuff, we're always able to load the crushed Naquium into a spaceship and take it away because I don't, I don't, want, the, um, I don't want the logistics here to be the, the, uh, the, the bottleneck in the Naquium production. Now that said, I think I also have some spaceships that are a bit closer together than they should be. The Stardust Enterprise and the Star Spear and the Star Two Dust Two Dustier all seem to be rather too close together around here, and they're all sort of queuing up at, in, to, to land. Well, the Stardust Two the Dustier is queuing up to land in, on Talos or to land in Talos orbit. So there does seem to be a bit too much um, over here in Talos at the moment. So maybe having them having them queuing up here means that things are working quite well. Yeah, I don't think it does. I think I need them to be queuing at the other end in, in, at Stardust. But seeing them queuing up here does make me think that at least at the moment, the uh, production rate is not going to have any issues. Anyway, I've gone on a bit today. I think that's probably quite enough. I've talked quite a bit about uh, the road trip and the puzzles and also then moving on to a little bit, little bit of Naquium because that is the advanced thing. So please come back over the weekend for the other part of this video where I should be talking about some of the other things we've been digging up and, and what's been going on around there and how, and how we've been trying to get just get the factory flowing nicely and producing everything that we need. I will then be back on Monday for the stream. That'll be 7:30 uh, p.m. UK time. We've had an hour change now, so we're on uh, British Summer Time instead of GMT. If that affects you, then um, please be aware of it. Uh, where we'll be coming on, we'll be carrying on looking at the puzzles. We'll do some more pyramids. We'll get the um, we'll try and get the power system up and running on um, in Fenestra, and just see how things go next time as well. And then after that, I'll be back on Wednesday for the Satisfactory stream, uh, where I'm going to still be trying to produce nuclear power. Last week, I managed to start digging up uranium ore, but I haven't really done anything with it yet because that turned out to be a rather longer process than I was expecting, mostly due to some giant spiders. So uh, yeah, lots, lots to see on that stream as well. So make sure you come back Wednesday so you don't miss that. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.